it's about time we have a look at the rares and mythics from the murders at Karlov Manor and go through the ones that have been performing the best. So if you want to spend wild cards on something that you haven't got yet, these are the cards that are most worth those wild cards. Welcome back to the channel. We're going to break down the rares and mythics from Karlov Manor that are basically doing the best, seeing the most play, the ones that you can do the coolest stuff with. So don't forget to like this video and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already while we break these down. We're going to run through them pretty quickly. Um, and basically the way I'm looking at this is it's not just cards that happen to be good maybe in one deck, but cards that can be used in various different decks. So I have a list at the moment of all the rares in standard and mythics in standard that I would think are worth your wild cards. So basically you can use them in multiple decks. They're not just uh, like a one-off card that will only work if you build around it. Like Arcane Bombardment, I love it, but it's not one you include a lot in lots of different decks. But Shield Red, maybe you include that in every deck that has black in it at all. So that's basically what we're looking at. Cards that fit into different types of decks. So if you use your wild cards on them, they're not going to be wasted. They're going to be used in different ways. So... First of all, we're just going to go through them by color and talk about like the best ones. So Case of the Uneaten Feast. This is the life gain case. This is probably the case that's seen the most play, I imagine, of all the ones that uh, I've looked at. Probably. Um, yes, so you gain life when creatures enter. You gain five or more life. You then get to sacrifice this case and play some creatures from your graveyard. So in the white and black life gain decks, this is seeing lots of play. But anything where you want to keep gaining life, maybe even against mono red, this would be good. Even if you're not a life gain deck, because it's going to keep you alive when they're trying to burn out those last few points. So definitely a very good card to use, especially if you want to be able to play things from your graveyard, obviously. We've got Doorkeeper Thrall. So this one has seen some interesting play. I haven't used it very much myself, but it's a two mana, one, two flash flying that stops um, artifacts and creatures triggering abilities when they enter. So if your opponent's playing Natali, you can flash this out before Natali hits the battlefield and therefore it doesn't trigger. So if anyone, if you're playing against a domain deck and they've got Leyline Binding, anyone who's relying on ETB effects, this can basically shut it down. It's really cheap, it's only two mana. So it's a really, really good card for those kind of control decks. The only Streetwise Lookout um, is Although it's a human and it's white, it's not necessarily good in a mono white human style deck because it only affects creatures you control with power two or less. And in those kind of decks, whether it's with the Coppercoat Vanguard or with the um, uh, the Adversary, the life three one life link that puts counters on everything, it boosts the power of all your creatures, so they're not going to be power two or less. So it's not going to help with that. But any other deck that has creatures that don't get boosted, so maybe not a kind of human synergy deck, Delny can do some really cool things by allowing their abilities to trigger an additional time. So kind of opposite to Doorkeeper Thrall, if you're relying on these ETB triggers, you get to trigger things twice, but also they can't be blocked by creatures with power three or greater, so it helps you get through some damage. Then we've got Aurelia's Vindicator, four mana, four to Angel, has flying, it has life link, it has ward too. Also, it has disguise, so you can play it as the face down side. And then when you turn it face up, you pay three, a white, and X. Whatever X is, is the number of creatures that you exile from the battlefield or from graveyards. And then when it dies, you return those exile cards to the opponent's to the owner's hands. So if you take your opponent's creatures off the battlefield and take your creatures from the graveyard, when um the Vindicator dies. It will come back to your hand. You can play your creatures again. They can play their creatures again, but you've got things back from the graveyard. So it's really, really good. Also, just being an angel, angel decks are so good. Lifelink with four, um, four power means you're going to be, you know, gaining quite a lot of life each turn. Ward two makes it difficult to kill. It's got lots of things going for it, really. So it's a really, really good card from the set. And yeah, that's all the white cards. Um, okay, so onto the blue cards, we have Cryptic Coat. So it's three mana artifact equipment. When it enters, you cloak the top card of your library. That's placing that face down, and it becomes the 2-2 two, two, Ward 2 creature. But it also has 
an extra plus one, so it's three, two, and it can't be blocked. So three mana, you're getting a three, two, ward two, unblockable creature. That's pretty good in itself. But you can also return Cryptic Coat, coat back to your hand and play it again and keep doing that. So lots of value over and over again. It's a really, really good card to use, um, especially, I think, against control decks. Although I don't, I'm not an expert in control, but I think having that kind of replayability is really, really useful. And to make it even better, if it's a creature card that you happen to cloak, you can still pay the mana cost and flip it back over. If it has an ETB effect, that doesn't trigger because it's already on the battlefield, just in case, you know, cloak and Atali, flip it over, cloak and Atraxa. It won't do the ETB thing, but you still get a uh, the creature. So you could get something maybe with high power and toughness, or yeah, something with high power, do lots of damage when the opponent isn't expecting it. But also turning the creature over doesn't remove the cryptic coat. So if you have some big lifelink or big power creature, it's still going to have that plus one and unblockable as long as you keep the cryptic coat on it and then you can return that to your hand whenever you want to. So it's a really, really good kind of value ongoing. Then we've got Reenact the Crime. This has seen um, a lot of use, especially in combo decks. Discard anything. On turn four and bring it back without playing any without paying any cost you know things like saying breach the multiverse on turn four I've seen lots of combo decks do that kind of thing there's lots of other things you can do with it i just like it even just in a mono blue jace mill deck where you put jace out minus five take 15 cards from them and then you play reenact the crime and bring that jace back from the graveyard or if you kill your opponent's jace you can then bring your opponent's jace onto the graveyard on your side because there's anything that's gone to the graveyard that turn. So really, really useful. Also actually exiles it from the graveyard. So if your opponent is trying to discard something to reanimate for themselves, you not only copy it and you make a token for yourself, so you've kind of stolen the reanimation target, you've also taken it away from them so now they can't do it on their next turn. There's loads of things you can do with that. It's obviously very heavy on the blue mana, which could be a problem if you don't have very many rare lands, but there are lots and lots of rare lands, the two color lands at the moment. So if you do have those, the color requirements are not too much of a problem. Then we've got Intrude on the Mind. Five mana instant. Reveal the top five cards of your library. Put them into two piles, and the opponent can choose which pile you get to keep. The other pile goes into the graveyard, and you make a Thopter with plus one counters on it equal to the cards put into your graveyard. So you either get five cards and no creature, no cards and a five five creature, or somewhere in between three cards and a two two creature, whatever it happens to be. So it's great to be able to put out a surprise blocker when your opponent's attacking you because this is instant speed, but also possibly drawing five cards. If they don't want you to get the creature, I'm gonna give you five cards instead. Um, so yeah, but even a five mana, 5-5 five, five flying creature that with flash, effectively, is pretty good, even if they put things in your graveyard. And sometimes you want things in your graveyard. Maybe you've got Reenact the Crime, you're going to cast both of them at the same time if you have like 9 mana up. Sure, you could do that. You put the 5 cards in your graveyard, you pick your favourite one, you bring it back. So lots of things you can do with Intrude on the Mind, which I think makes it a really cool card to have. Then we've got Conspiracy Unraveler, which is part of the Reenact the Crime Breach the Multiverse combo, but also just other things you can do with it, which is pretty cool. Um, it's great in that Breach the Multiverse deck because it costs a lot. If you can cheat it out early and get loads of things in your graveyard, then you can collect Evidence 10 pretty easily, especially if you have lots of um, high mana cost spells to do and those split cards like Push-Pull, which are like eight, uh, eight mana's worth, even in just one card. Then it makes it really easy to cast as many spells as you want. And yeah, that can finish the game itself. It's great to get it out early, but it can also be good later on in the game, I guess, if you get that out. If you survive that long, your opponent doesn't have very much, and then you get to start casting things for free because you've got lots of things in the graveyard. That could work as well. Combo one's probably a bit more fun. But that's all the blue cards we've got now. Um, then on to the black cards, which I think this might be my favorite. If I had to pick a color here, yeah, that's my favorite. It'll be the black ones. Uh, the Case of the Stashed Skeleton. Maybe not as much as the case of the Uneaten Feast, but you do see this one quite a lot. It makes a 2-1 creature with menace that can't block, so you have to deal with that at some point anyway. To solve it, 
you have to control no suspected skeletons. So the opponent kills it, you kill it, uh, you yeah, fading hope it, whatever you want to do, uh, path of peril, get rid of that, get rid of everything else. And now you have a two mana tutor. Search your library for any card, pull it into your hand and shuffle at sorcery speed. So if you have combos, it's going to help you find the combos. If you just have a deck with lots of different tools in it, so board wipes, planeswalkers, whatever you might need, counter spells maybe, you can basically just search for anything whenever you need it. So it's a really, really good case to have. Um, yeah, lots of value you get from that. Then we've got Deadly Cover-Up. Five mana, board wipe in black. Other than this, black has basically had Path of Peril, which just deals with small creatures, or Gix's Command, which also mostly deals with small creatures or like one big creature. There hasn't been anything in black recently in Standard which just kills everything. Path of Peril, you can cleave it, you pay some white. You tend to have to bring in another color, basically. You have to pretty much bring in white if you want to kill everything. But with Deadly Cover-Up, you can kill everything. And not just that, you can also exile things from the opponent's graveyard and take the rest out of their deck. So if they have a Jace and they're relying on Jace as their win con, take it out of their graveyard, take the rest out, and they'll probably quit because they can't do anything else. Or if the opponent just has um, counter spells that you don't like. You can also take out basic lands if your opponent as um, is playing some kind of ramp deck, ideally monocolored maybe, um, and they've only got a few cards out so far, they've got one land in their graveyard, you can play Deadly Cover-Up, you can take away the land from their graveyard and take all their other basic lands. If they're relying on basic lands, they basically have pretty much no lands left in their deck. Now, it can go both ways. If they have enough lands to do what they want to do, then they're just going to draw a useful spell every turn rather than flooding out. But if they need those lands, if you're in that kind of case where they need the lands and you can remove them, pretty fun thing to do as well. And then we've got Vein Ripper. By itself, I didn't necessarily think this was that good, considering we have other cards that are just as big, maybe cheaper, have similar power and toughness. But what's great about Vein Ripper is that um, it has this ward sacrifice a creature. So if your opponent doesn't have any creatures, it's basically hexproof. And when a creature dies, you... Uh, gain two life, your opponent loses two life. So if they block it with small creatures, you're going to be gaining life anyway. If you compare that to Archfiend of the Dross, which is a four mana 6-6 six, six flyer, and you still make the opponent lose two life when one of their creatures dies. In this case, we're pretty much paying a little bit extra to gain some life and to have that powerful ward ability as well. And if creature types matter to you, vampires and assassins could make a bigger difference than the you know, Archfiend of the Dross Demon. But also with the Archfiend, you have the big drawback of the oil counters that come off and you can lose the game if you don't finish it fast enough. So Bane Ripper, I guess, yeah, a bit better than that, depending on the kind of deck you're using. And obviously this has done a lot recently in like Pro Tours when you've had like vampire synergy decks. And there's some cool combos you can do with this, like with push-pull as well. So there's lots of things you can do with Vein Ripper. It's a really strong creature, something that the opponent has to deal with pretty quickly. And then we've got Outrageous Robbery, possibly one of my favorite. Yeah, I think it's one of my favorite ones from the whole set. The opponent exiles the top X cards of their library face down, and you get to look at those cards. You can play them for as long as they're exiled, and you can cast those spells as if your mana was any type of mana. Obviously, you kind of need that. Like if, you're, if you're playing a black deck and you're against a green deck and you exile all their cards and you have no green mana, you can't play anything. So it wouldn't be very useful. But being able to play those things using your swamps is really, really useful. It's basically like um, a Silver Scrutiny, which is the X, blue, blue, draw X cards. But this isn't reliant on hand size because those cards are exiled. You still have your cards and you have the opponent's cards, so they might not be synergistic with what you're trying to do. But quite often, people just play cards that are just generally good rather than ones that only work together. So you're probably going to pick something good out of the opponent's deck using this. And also, it can be a win con in itself by just exiling your whole opponent's deck if you get enough mana from somewhere. So lots of things you can do with robbery. It's just so much fun. Moving on to the red cards we have. Um, the red cards I don't think are as strong as the other colors in this set, but Pyrotechnic Performer is a card that can disguise, and when it or another creature you control is turned face up, the 
creature deals damage equal to its power to each opponent. So there's things you can do with this that make basically a pretty strong burn deck. If you have a couple of these pyrotechnic performers out and you flip over a creature that's a 5-5, five, five, then you're going to be doing 10 damage to the opponent's face as well as flipping it over the creature and getting any other effects from that. So if you want to have some kind of burn deck with maybe high-powered creatures that you can flip over, maybe you use Cryptic Coat to disguise them if they're not cards that disguise themselves, then I think you can do pretty good with Pyrotechnic Performer. It's performed well in a few different lists. Okay, then we've got Krenko Baron of Tin Street. We're getting there with Goblins again in Standard. I used to have a Goblin deck a couple of years ago. I really, really liked it. It rotated out. But we're bringing Goblins back, I think, because Krenko is not too bad. It's a 3-mana, three 3-3 three, three haste, which is good. Also, you can sacrifice an artifact, but a plus one counter on each Goblin you control. Before that triggers, you can also pay one red and create a Goblin, which gains haste. It's a 1-1, one, one, but it gets a counter, so actually you're making a 2-2 two, two Goblin as well. You just have to have artifacts to sacrifice. And we've got other good artifact sacrifice synergies in Isle of Mana. So we can definitely have lots of artifacts to sacrifice, whether that's blood tokens or map tokens or treasure tokens or anything else, clue tokens. There's lots of things you can do. So I'm looking forward to doing some more things with Krenko, using Krenko in some cool decks. I think that's a pretty good goblin. And if we get a few more good goblins in the next few sets, there's going to be a really strong goblin deck, I reckon. Then we've got Incinerator of the Guilty. It's a six mana, six, six flying trample. It's a dragon, which is pretty cool. And when it um, deals combat damage to a player, you may collect evidence X. When you do, it does X damage to each creature and planeswalker that player controls. So it's pretty much a one-sided board wipe. The fact that it has trample means that it can pretty reliably do combat damage to your opponent. Flying, it makes it evasive anyway. And if they have some 1-1 one -one bats or a couple of smallish flying creatures to block it, you're still going to do that combat damage and you're still going to be able to collect evidence from your graveyard and basically wipe out everything they have. So, Dragon Synergy decks, sure, it would be great in that kind of thing. But to be honest, it's just a great creature in itself. Maybe you need to reanimate it early on. You have to have enough evidence in your graveyard to be able to do the thing, be able to wipe the board if you need to. But bring it back, get it to do damage, clear out all the opponent's stuff, and then, well, they have to deal with it pretty quickly because... A 6-6 six, six Flying Trample, when you've killed all their creatures, is going to kill them in a couple of turns. And there's obviously also lots of other good dragons in standard at the moment, so this is a great addition to those. Moving on to the green cards, we have Sharp-Eyed Rookie. It's a 2-mana, two 2-2 two, two Vigilance Human Detective. When creatures enter the battlefield, if their power or toughness is higher than Sharp-Eyed Rookie's power or toughness. You get to put a plus one counter on it so it grows a bit like evolving adaptive. You also create a clue token. You also get to investigate. So it creates tokens of itself. All you have to do is keep putting out bigger and bigger creatures, which green does pretty well. And you're going to have those uh, clue tokens if you need to keep drawing cards, which I mean, green can run out of cards pretty easily. It doesn't have good ways of drawing it. So this is a great way of using some extra mana to draw some other big creatures and keep hitting the opponent with aggro. And do you know what? Having Vigilance on it as well is really good because even if you're against something like on a red aggro decks or Boros or whatever you're against, you can still use this to block as well, which is really good. And it gets bigger and bigger. So there's lots of value you can get from Sharp-Eyed Rookie. I think it's a really cool card. Then we've got Arch Druid's Charm. It's a three mana instant where you get to either search your library for a creature or land, a land onto the battlefield or creature into your hand. You can put a plus one counter on a creature you control when it deals damage equal to its power to another creature the opponent controls, or you can exile an artifact or enchantment. So it's really good for removal. It's really good for taking out creatures. It's also good for taking out artifacts or enchantments. And if you don't need to take anything out, you can search for whatever you need. If you're missing a land, if, you, um, if you're looking, looking for a very specific creature, you basically pick anything you like with it. So there's loads of things you can do with it. Obviously, being three green mana in the casting cost means that it's going to be best in mono green. You can use it in other things, obviously, with all the rare cards that we have, rare lands we have at the moment. They're going to be multiple colors, but it's going to do better in a mono green style deck. We've got Case of a Locked Hot House next. It's a four mana case, which 
kind of doesn't do anything to start with. You can play an additional land on each of your turns. If you don't have too many lands, it's not going to do much. But if you do have something which puts lands into your hand rather than onto the battlefield, then it does help you ramp in that way. And when you control seven or more lands, then you solve it and you can look at the top card of your library and cast, uh, play lands, cast creatures and enchantments from the top of your library at any time. So if you have a deck that is mostly lands, creatures and enchantments, you can pretty much play anything off the top of your deck and, um, you know, it helps you ramp to get there. So although it doesn't do anything much near the beginning, at the end, once it's solved, it can do loads and loads of work for you, bringing out creatures and enchantments as quickly as possible. When you have lots of mana as well, you're going to be able to play a couple of things each turn. It's basically like drawing extra cards whenever you need it. So I think it's a really good one, especially in domain decks. I think it works pretty well there. Also, maybe in mono green, you're going to have lots of creatures. So I'm sure you'll get pretty good use out of that. Then we have the Axe, Bane, Ferox, 4 mana, 4-4, four, four, Death Touch, Haste, Ward, Collect, Evidence, 4. So if you can control your opponent's graveyard, exile things from their graveyard using you know, Armored Scrap Gorger just to pick out the big things or anything that just clears the whole graveyard, then it's basically a 4-4 four, four, Death Touch, Haste, Hexproof creature. So if you're playing any kind of green aggro or maybe, uh, you know, green and red, a kind of aggro deck, then you're going to get lots of value from the Ferox. It's going to be really hard for your opponent to deal with it. They pretty much have to block because of the ward cost, unless they want to wipe the board. And if they have to block, they're going to be blocking something with Death Touch. So whatever they're blocking with is probably going to die. And if they don't block it, they're taking four damage. So it's really, really good. I like that in a kind of mono green aggro deck. But any, any kind of green deck that's relying on tough creatures that are kind of resilient, this one fits in for me. So we're going to move on to the multicolored cards and the best multicolored card from the set, like the one that's made the biggest impact on standard, which I really liked before before this came out. I knew it was going to be good. I don't think I quite knew how good it was going to be, but War Leader's Call, cool. three mana enchantment, creatures get plus one, plus one, and whenever a creature enters, it deals one damage to the opponent. I like it in... Um, some you know combo decks where you make this do more than one damage when creatures enter but to be honest you don't need that just lots of little creatures and you have a boros aggro convoke deck and it's like one of the biggest decks in standard at the moment probably um maybe not as popular as mono red aggro i haven't looked at the exact stats but it's going to be pretty high up there in one of the most common decks you're going to see so obviously craft this you're going to get lots of use out of it then we've got kaya spirits justice Four mana planeswalker that can exile cards, bring things back, turn tokens into other creatures. Basically, you can surveil, you can create tokens, and you can exile your own creatures. And for each other player with the minus two, you can exile up to one target creature they control as well. So it's really good at controlling things, bringing back certain creatures at certain times, and putting things into your graveyard. There's lots of things you can do with Kaya. If you like that kind of deck, you're going to have probably board wipes and planeswalkers and Kaya would fit into pretty much anything like that. And we've got Ezrim Agency Chief. I haven't used this much myself, but I know it does pretty well in some lists. It's basically a five mana, five, five flyer, which is okay to start with, but it also investigates twice when it enters, which is great value to get as well. So even if it gets killed, you still got two clue tokens to do something with. But you can pay one mana at instant speed to sacrifice an artifact, which could be the clue tokens or something else, and it gains your choice of Vigilance, Lifelink, or Hexproof until end of turn. So this is a very, very easy to protect creature that is something the opponent has to deal with because a 5-5 five, five flyer that could possibly gain Lifelink is a big thing. You want to have something that creates lots of artifacts, obviously, because you need to have those artifacts in order to sacrifice them to gain the Hexproof and everything. But there's lots of ways of making clue tokens and different things in uh, in Standard at the moment. You could even have something like the Chrome Host Seed Shark. So whenever you play any non-creature spell, you're going to make another artifact creature, the Incubator Tokens. It's not a creature, but it can turn into a creature. So you can use those Incubator Tokens as well as something to sacrifice to give Ezrim Hexproof when you need it. So I can see lots of value you can get from that and some cool decks you can make. So try that one out if you want to. 
Then we've got Rakdos, Patron of Chaos. It's a 6 mana 6-6 six, six Flying Trample, which there are a few creatures like that. Um, so it's pretty good in those kind of mid-range decks. And at the beginning of your end step, so basically you play this on your turn. By the end of your turn, if the opponent hasn't killed it, they have to sacrifice two non-land, non-token permanents, which I think is important. There's lots of tokens someone could sacrifice. And if they don't, you get to draw two cards. So they basically have to instantly deal with it. Otherwise, you get two cards, and you've still got the big trampley creature on the battlefield. You have to deal with it at some point. So we can get lots of value out of that. And then we have maybe maybe the most fun card from the set, Doppelgang. Uh, so it's blue, green, three Xs. But each of X target permanents create X tokens that are a copy of that permanent. So you're paying five mana, so X is three. You copy one thing once, you get one copy of something for five mana, which is okay. But if you pay eight mana, where X is now equal to two, you're getting two copies of two different permanents. So that's quite a lot for eight mana. But you scale this up, and you could be playing paying something like X equals five, and you get five copies of five different permanents, and it goes crazy. Don't do anything more than that. I've seen people do like 10 copies of 10 permanents. It will just crash the game. Arena cannot handle that. But if you have some kind of Simic ramp deck or anything, like, you know, Mind Splice apparatus that's just going to make um, instants and sorceries cost less each turn, means you can ramp up to this, something like Virtue of Strength, to increase the mana you get from basic lands by three times as much. You're going to be able to get lots and lots of value from Doppelgang, and it's going to be fun just stealing your opponent's biggest things. And to top off the rares in the set, we also have all of these surveil lands. There's lots of things going for these lands. Obviously, we have all the different colors. Uh, they enter tapped, but they get to surveil one, which helps you when you want to put things in the graveyard or if you want to find certain things. Surveilling is going to help you get there. Obviously, they have two colors each, but also they have the two different basic land types as well. So if you have something which helps you search for a planes, not a basic planes, and you can five meticulous archive if you want to. It also means they could go well in decks that care about domain and how many basic land types you have and lots of things like that because they all include them. And it's always good to have as many two color lands as possible if you want to be able to play the most varied decks. You don't want to just be stuck with mono red or mono white. You want to be able to do some different things putting in two or three or maybe even more colors into a deck, you're going to need some cards like this. And because these are going to be around in standard for the next two and a half years, you're definitely going to want to have some of them. So if you have wild cards you want to spend maybe on getting some rare lands, you probably don't want to get the rare lands that are going to be rotating out in September. You might want to get these ones. They're going to last for an extra two years. And that's all the rare and mythic cards I'm going to put down as my favorites from the Murders at Carl of Mana, based on decks I've seen people play, the stats that seem to be out there, and things that have been fun for me to play as well. So if you have wild cards and you want to craft something new, you can craft other rares and mythics from the set if you want to. They're probably not going to be quite as versatile as these ones. These are just my recommendations. So let me know what you think in the comments below, if you like any of these cards much more than others, or if you think there's any cards here that don't belong on this list, let me know what you think. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Check out my Patreon link if you want to support the channel even more. And thanks for watching this one to the end. I will see you in the next video.